Good morning to you here at Balham this morning, and good morning to our sites at Battersea and Westside. Good morning to our online community, if you're watching there this morning, or to those who might be listening to this later on this week. As you may be aware, we have been teaching through a series on Ephesians, and believe it or not, we are almost coming in to land. However, some of you might be wondering how on earth that's possible when we're only on chapter four and we don't get to chapter six until next week. That's because we're covering not just one, not two, but three chapters this morning. But you guys brought snacks, right? Yeah, you guys did. Check you out. We come prepared. So why so much in one go? Well, last week, this series changed direction. If you've been following along, you'll know that Paul, the author of this letter, has spent the first three chapters painting this incredible picture of what God has been doing from before creation, throughout the history of the Jewish people, to Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the early church, which united both Jews and Gentiles into a new community, saved by grace and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. But now he's changing tack. He's writing very specifically in these next three chapters about how to live life in response to this redemption story. How to live as the people of God in a way that reflects God's goodness on the earth. Tim Mackey of The Bible Project puts it like this. In the first half of the letter, Paul shares this grand vision of Jesus as the redeemer and resurrected king of a new humanity that's made up of every kind of person, ethnically, socioeconomically, and culturally. And in the second half of the letter, Paul explores what it is actually going to require. The character traits, life habits, moral commitment, and relational commitment that is going to be required to live as this new and different kind of community together. So we are going to turn to chapters four to six to consider our response to what God has done for us. I'm going to read some of this as we go along, but I encourage you to go back and read the whole thing again this week. I promise you it will take less time than the Barbie movie, and even if you're a slow reader, it will take less time than Oppenheimer. Across the sites last week, we looked at the beginning of chapter four, and our brilliant team of speakers reminded us of our unity in Christ and the role of the church to help us collectively to grow up in Christ. This unity is both a gift and a calling in a world full of division. A unity that doesn't require uniformity, but thrives in diversity. And London is, of course, one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the world. But Paul's world was full of diversity too. We know that the churches of Ephesus were located in what we now know as Turkey. But the Roman Empire was hugely multicultural, stretching from North Africa through the Middle East and into Europe, with people traveling across the regions, attracted by the potential for trade or brought there as slaves. We know that Ephesus was a huge city of commercial, cultural, and military importance, where the worship of the goddess Artemis and the imperial cult would have pervaded every area of ordinary life. This meant that the first century Gentile Christians faced daily decisions as they extracted themselves from the pagan practices that they'd grown up with and had previously governed their lives. And for the Jewish believers, they had to figure out how to welcome and include these former pagans, even as they navigated their traditions and practices. So the challenge for the early church then was not just how to live differently from the people around them, but how to love differently within their own community. And that's what I want you to think about this morning as I run through this. How can we live differently in order to love differently? Because as we were reminded last week, we don't need the same distinctions as they had, to recognize the tendency in our times and even in our congregations to find difference and division. It's our very human tendency to be drawn to those like us and to withdraw from those who are not. 
to place restrictions on those whom we believe the appropriate standards are not being met, and to make allowances for those who we think should be shown a little more freedom. Paul's instructions to this very mixed bunch of individuals about how to live as a new kind of community began in chapter 4 with these words. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. This is a calling that he's made clear in the rest of the letter is to be the people of God. So he begins this section, his shift, his pivot with these words, live a life worthy of your calling. And he's gone on in those early verses to describe what it looks like as we grow up in Christ, to move beyond infancy in our faith to maturity, trained and equipped within this new community for a life worthy of our calling in every way. But in case we weren't clear about how that starts or what that is, Paul goes on in verses 17 to 24 to tell us what it is not. So that's where we're going to jump in. Ephesians 4, verse 17. So I tell you this, Paul writes, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Now, the Gentiles hearing that are going to be thinking, but, but we are Gentiles. So how, how do we do that? Paul writes, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. But that is not the way that you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul likes this image of taking off and putting on, taking off an old life of futility and putting on a new life of holiness taking off a formal life of deceitful desires and putting on a new life of truth. And he is uncompromising, isn't he, about the dramatic shift that's required in our thinking and our behavior as followers of Christ. A shift that requires a change in identity, in priorities, and in purpose. And it makes sense for him to speak this way to those who were outside the Jewish faith, to the Gentiles that are in this congregation, in these households, listening to this letter read aloud. Their lives had been centered around idolatry, superstition, hedonism, and hierarchy. But that's not Paul's story, and maybe it's not yours. Elsewhere, Paul goes to great lengths to tell us of his religious credentials before he came to Christ of all the ways he kept the righteous requirements of his faith. But like the two sons in Jesus' parable in Luke 15, the prodigal younger son and the pious older brother, Paul knows that we are all in need of the grace of God. Whatever our history, we're all in need of the grace of God, and we've all got work to do. To be in Christ, which is Paul's favorite description of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, it is a supernatural transaction initiated by the saving grace of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit. But it is put into practice by us as we take off and put on in the ordinary stuff of everyday life. It is because of what God has done for us that we do what we must do. All of us have thinking and behavior that keeps us from God, that keeps us from this new life that he would have us live. So whatever our lives might look like otherwise, none of us is too good or too bad for the grace of God. None of us has qualified or disqualified ourselves for this new way of life. But each of us has been adopted into this family by surrendering our lives to him. And it is immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. Next, Paul gives us some very specific instructions about what it's going to take to live and love well in this community. 
This is a longer section. I'm not going to read all of it, but quite a large chunk. And these verses need very little commentary from me. So uh, let's just read them through, starting in Ephesians 4, verse 25. You better brace yourselves. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing should steal no more, but must work, doing something useful with their hands, that they might have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Follow God's example, Paul writes, as dearly loved children. In another translation, this says, be imitators of God. So let's just sit with that phrase for a minute. For all the commandments of the Old Testament, the purpose of the law was to shape a people who reflected God, to enable them to know what love looked like, what holiness looked like, what justice and mercy looked like, that they might build their lives around it and show the world around them what it looked like to be children of God. But it was also a constant reminder of how far they fell short of it. So God provided sacrifices for them to bridge the gap and to reconcile himself to them and for them to be reconciled to each other, which in turn demonstrated his holiness and grace. But there was still something missing. Later in their history, the prophets began to speak of a future time when the law would be written on the heart when holiness and grace would be internalized somehow, and God would be at work in humanity from the inside out. Paul believes this time had come, that Jesus had become the ultimate sacrifice for us, and that his spirit was at work within us, empowering us to be transformed from the inside out, empowering us to become imitators of God. So this section, full of instructions on how we might live a life worthy of this calling, is important. We might think that it involves great works of power or history-making miracles, but it seems to me when you read the New Testament, that's the easy part. Instead, it speaks to us of how we'll deal with anger and bitterness and lying, how we'll deal with sex and money, how we'll speak to each other and what kind of work we'll do, and how we'll practice kindness, generosity, and forgiveness in order to live as this diverse and very different community, united in love, living differently and loving differently. Elsewhere in this letter, Paul has described this church, this community, as the household of God, A Christ-shaped, grace-fueled, spirit-filled, ethnically diverse family. And he's just given us some instructions about how to get started with that. That section ends and the next one begins with this, this verse. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
It concludes all that we've just heard with a call to mutual submission to one another within the church, and it sets the scene for the next section. Now Paul is going to give us a very real example of what this looks like within a home, with an alternate version of something his listeners would have been familiar with called the household code. In the traditional household codes, only the head of the household was addressed. That would most often be the husband, the father, and the master of this micro-community. Because I don't want you to imagine a neat little Western nuclear family with a picket fence. I want you to imagine a multi-generational, maybe multicultural household. A group of individuals, a lot like us. Some would have been related, some employed, some enslaved but they lived in this shared space and they used it for worship, for business, and some for learning. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this passage. I'm going to summarize some of the verses because I spoke on a passage similar to this last year in 1 Peter 2 on the subject of submission. But let's take a look at a summary of each of these sections. First, Paul addresses wives and then husbands. He instructs wives to submit to their husbands as they would to Christ, and husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, giving himself up for her. Next, he addresses children and then fathers. He instructs children to obey their parents and fathers not to exasperate their children. And finally, he addresses slaves and then masters. He instructs slaves to obey their masters and to serve wholeheartedly as they would Christ. And masters on how to treat their slaves, because God shows no favoritism between them. Now, there's plenty in there for us to be shocked, amazed, or moderately offended by. But let's take a little step back. We need to know that Paul's concern was not to overthrow the Roman system of slavery, which from our perspective, of course, it should have been. Neither was it to liberate women, which we would very much like it to have been. And neither was it to prioritize children's welfare over anyone else's. But what he was speaking of was an equality of value, a freedom from within, and the dignity of every individual within this new family of God. Individuals who were to love and serve one another as Christ loved and served them with his life. Traditionally, these were written instructions to the patriarch of this household, But Paul's words would have been read aloud to all those gathered together, all ages, men and women, Jew and Gentile, slave and free. And they would have heard Paul address the typically subordinate members of the household first each time, addressing them as equal members of this household in contrast to the hierarchy in which they lived. What Paul is doing is reminding every member of this household of their own agency in the midst of their closest relationships. How will they live? How will they treat one another in light of the grace they have received? In particular, how will those with power treat those without? Because what Paul is painting here is a microcosm of the church. And what you see when you strip out all the big ideas, all the contextual relevancy, all the churchy language, is what is at heart of the biblical narrative. What matters is how we treat each other. The Bible has a lot to say about how we treat the stranger, from its earliest instructions to the words of Jesus. We know that. But Paul here is addressing how we treat one another at home, perhaps when no one else can see. We've seen from the first chapter of Ephesians that Paul has told an incredible, epic narrative of God's work of redemption. It is the greatest story ever told, but it is more than a story. It has flesh and blood consequences for every one of us. It has the power to change our lives, our families, our communities. The church, this church, is a witness to the world when we defy the expectations of those around us and learn how to love one another. Not to treat love as a free pass to behave however we choose, or to hold up love as an impossible standard, but to learn how to love one another 
as Christ loves us, to live differently and love differently. What does that look like? Paul has given us a glimpse of an ordinary household, and despite all its cultural differences and challenges, it is a picture that I think we recognize today. The risk of parents, partners, and those in power to mistreat one another is ever present. But in contrast, Paul calls us to submit to one another and to love and serve one another as Christ has done for us. How on earth do we live like that? It is by the power of God within us. Hence Paul's lengthy prayers in chapters 2 and 3 and the work that we have to do alone and together that he sets out for us in chapters 4, 5 and 6. And why? Why do we do this? Why does this matter? Because this is how we bear witness to the grace that you and I have received and reflect God in the flesh, in our flesh, in our community, for the sake of those around us. This biblical vision of a community of people, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, socially and economically diverse, who live differently and love differently, is meant to be a witness to the work of God. We are meant to be a walking, talking gospel. Too often, of course, we act like a dysfunctional car crash, (laughs) where power is abused and the marginalized are excluded. But it all starts with us. In our homes, in our households, in our families, with our friends, in this community. Paul gives us some challenging but very simple instructions to follow. Don't lie. Be kind. Watch your language. Don't misuse sex and money. Get rid of bitterness and rage. Treat one another well. Be patient and humble. Love one another as Christ has loved you. N.T. Wright puts it like this, explaining why this was so attractive and appealing to a watching world. Those first three centuries of the church, it did not spread by the great ideas that were being passed from one great theological brain to another. That was the backup system, the steering to make sure that the show stayed on the road. The church spread by people living in a different way. They didn't expose their baby girls like everyone else did, which means when they gave birth to daughters, they didn't leave them on the street to die. They looked after the poor, they looked after the sick, they cared for people who were not of their family or race. Here is a new way of being human, doing the good things that God has already prepared for us. There is not much about mission with a capital M in Ephesians. But there's a huge amount about the church living in a new way of being human. To live differently and to love differently is to live the life worthy of our calling. Can I ask the bands to come back up? Back in chapter 5, Paul also writes, Be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout Ephesians, we've seen Paul turn our attention back to God in worship and prayer again and again. Asking that the eyes of our hearts would be opened, that we would know the depth and the width and the height and the breadth of his love towards us and that we would experience the power of his spirit to live and love very differently. 